Twiga is the umbrella organization that represents all interests for both vineyard and winery. Um, primarily focuses obviously um, legislative education, marketing, um, advocacy, But also, there's an element of bringing us together to be able to you know, allow new growers and new, new wineries to, to learn from those that have come before uh, and be able to get assistance in getting started uh, in their business. A lot of people don't realize that uh, in 1900, we had 19 Texas wineries. So we're, we're the latest version of the, in the, this, the story, you know, because in the uh, late 1800s, there was really an influx of Germans and Italians that started producing wine. And uh, prohibition is the thing that stopped a lot of this in 1919. Well, Texas came out of prohibition in 33. And there was a, a, a big boom in new wineries that, that developed in the 30s and the 40s. And almost all of them went out of business again in the 50s. And I always wondered, why did they go out of business? What caused them to go out of business? And it was the oppressive uh, regulation of the alcohol uh, industry. Uh, back in the 50s, in order to ferment, you had to have a a Texas alcohol beverage agent present during the fermentation and I was that shocked me when I when I read that because number one there weren't that many agents and so and we're all fermenting about the same time so I don't know how you could do that you know but they had to do that and they had a lot of paperwork that they had to fill out so m almost all of the wineries went out of business by the late 50s it was just too much for them to be able to handle. Uh, and really then uh, Valverde somehow uh, managed to live through all that in Del Rio because they were the only ones that survived prohibition. And uh, so then we came along in the late 70s, 80s uh, and 90s and now everyone looks at us as though we're the pioneers, but there were pioneers before, before us. Uh, and they were making simple wines, they were not competing internationally uh, and you know trying to get notoriety but they were consumed in Texas I mean they were and and a couple of them were big enough to even produce 50,000 gallons so it wasn't that they had little tiny garages I mean some of these guys were making quite a bit of wine uh, they were making them typically out of um, American varietals and native varietals they were not doing a whole lot of European vinifera like we do uh, so the industry is uh, you know here we are, you know, and so we'll look upon this 100 years from now and they'll go, yeah, those are the pioneers over there, but there were people before us. No, my wife and I, uh, became interested in French culture and cuisine. And she bought a cookbook, French menu cookbook by Richard Olney. And it recommended a wine with every course. So we went down to the strip and tried to buy the wines that were recommended. Well, of course they didn't have them. So I got a wine book and tried to see what might be like the wines that were in this cookbook became absolutely fascinated with the complexity and the interest of wine in the, the different types and styles and tastes. And so we uh, started looking for those and became interested in, in that. And then we found out that there were three tech professors 
Clint McPherson, Dr. Roy Mitchell, and Bob Reed that were attempting to start a wine growing enterprise on the High Plains. I worked for Clint McPherson some planting vines and talked to him and discussed him. We had grower meetings there and it just became absolutely contagious. Uh, the enthusiasm of people in those groups and the possibility of growing fine wine on the High Plains. Later on, you could drink when I was, when you're 18, when I was 18, and we joined what was called Free University, and a gentleman from Pinkies taught a fabulous wine course. We just shared wine costs and tasted some of the very best wines in the world, and we were hooked. This was something that we wanted to do, something that we wanted to be a part of. We identified uh, with this French culture and the French varieties that they were growing and the way that, just the way that they treated the world. It was a wonderful I was, thing. I was crossbreeding cattle at our Fall Creek Ranch and experimenting with some of the French breeds. And I thought it'd be really great to see them firsthand. Susan came up with this idea of a, of a wine tour of France. And I thought that was harmless enough. And so, um, you know, we, didn't really care anything about wine, but the, the, shortly before a friend of ours got us together who had a map. It was called Frederick Wildman's 21 Day uh, Wine Tour of France. And uh, he just happened to service Lafitte Carawad. And I thought, hmm, different than anything I've ever tasted. It kind of piqued my interest. Then we took the trip. And as I tell people, we spent three days on French cattle ranches and three weeks in French chateaus. And that was the end of me not caring anything about wine. Uh, graduated from Texas Tech, had worked in and around vineyards the entire time I was there. Graduated in, in uh, 74 and went to work for my father-in-law growing flowers. And that was an extremely fortuitous event because my dad had farmed and the intensive horticultural experience of growing a wide variety of flowering plants from poinsettias to mums to calanchos, hydrangeas, Easter lilies, tulips, we did everything. And it was a wonderful experience in learning horticulture. Very fortuitous because that intensive greenhouse horticulture is about halfway in intensive nature and capital expenditure between the farm farm products, my father grew wheat. And the grapes are about halfway in between that very intensive horticulture and where we were. In other words, it's far more intensive than anything that the farmers grew out there, but I had an idea of what was in store to do this. In other words, I understood what it took. Made a couple of trips to California, visited the Napa Valley, took extension courses uh, on winemaking and grape growing at UC Davis, but knew at that time in the mid 70s that we didn't know enough for me to be involved in a commercial vineyard product. Extremely fortuitously, my wife and I took a summer trip, six weeks to France. Kind of $4 a day, Fodars thing, and lived in the countryside and realized that winemaking in France was different from California. There were no shiny big vats. There were no corporate structure. There were just farmers out there with barrels and canvas hoses making world-class wine. We knew we couldn't do the California thing, the French thing we could do. Wine. And but the thing that struck me was the similarity between a lot of those areas in France, not all of them by any means, but a lot of them in parts of Texas, especially our hill country region. And so we came back, asked a lot of questions, put in a little experimental vineyard in 1975, and uh, opened a small winery in 1979, and uh, you know started trying to move down the road, which was not easy because there wasn't a road map. But then things were going well, but probably the best thing that happened to us, or one of the best things, 
was that we were very fortunate in being able to have Andre Shelichev be a consultant. He was uh, a legend in the wine industry, and he was very, very bullish on what we were doing, especially Bordeaux varieties. Andre probably is responsible for putting premium wines on the map in California. He was kind of the winemaker's winemaker's winemaker. And we were, as I said earlier, very blessed to have his, his yeah, input. It, uh, Messina Hoff actually uh, began when my wife Meryl and I married. Uh, that was in 1977. Uh, we had um, just purchased 100 acres out in the country. And our goal was, what are we going to plant? And so we planted 14,000 Christmas trees. And they promptly died in one year. So then we said, well, we've got to think about something else. And uh, the Lord led us to Ron Perry. Ron was a graduate student at Texas A&M University. And his PhD dissertation was the feasibility of growing grapes in Texas. And Ron sprained his ankle while playing intramural basketball. And I was a physical therapist. I had my own private practice in sports medicine. And so Ron was coming to me for therapy and we got to talking about his PhD and he said, you've got property in the country. I need to plant a one acre vineyard. Would you be interested? And so we did, we planted a one acre vineyard and uh, uh, that was part of Ron's dissertation. And he planted other vineyards around the state to see what varieties would do best in different parts of the state. And uh, the Lord opened up one door after another and uh, you know, that vineyard did extremely well. So we went from one acre to an additional seven acres. So now we had eight acres of grapes and it was 1982. And uh, we had to make a decision. Were we going to be grape growers or were we going to be wine And that's wine makers? when my father and I and, uh, partnered up and bought the farm at Pheasant Ridge, bought the land because explicitly because it was a good grape farm, which meant it was a bad cotton farm because the soil was too poor, it sloped too much, it sloped the wrong way. It was perfect for grapes, horrible for cotton, and that's the farm we bought. Planted vines in 1979, vines that had done well in the trials at A&M, uh, Chenin Blanc, Ruby Cabernet, some Sauvignon Blanc, a little bit of Simeon, and expanded later on. And after we started out selling grapes, primarily to Yano Estacado, and in 1982, we realized we were gonna be able to hold enough grapes back to do our own wine. And we did Pheasant Ridge. We only made red wines that year. And it was because uh, we knew that the, to gain the impact in the market, we needed to release a full line of wines. In other words, we'd have a red and a white, or a couple of whites to release. So we made just red wine, sold, all, sold uh, the whites off to Yano and just laid a marketing plan to build the winery on out. Uh, most of us have a strange story as to how we got here. You know, I was uh, coming from a, a doctor's family and a ranching family. And uh, I was going to go to med school, and I decided I didn't want to go to school that long. Went to uh, uh, law school. I used to have what they called a three-year law plan. Uh, got, got a law degree, did an Army stint, took to the Texas Supreme Court, and started in private practice. And I was obviously not the right candidate for becoming a wine maker, but. Turned out that that organic and quality quantity that I had taken turned out to be a little, a little bit of a benefit. But there, oh, something else that was a benefit was that uh, it, it, you can either love it or hate it or both, was I worked with the Texas legislature and Congress, um, drafted a lot of legislation. And so all of a sudden, one time it was time to, uh, you know, if you plant, something vineyards in an area where it's illegal to make wine like we did, you know, you got to make some legislative changes. And so I took a lot of the legislative contacts I had and what skills I had. And uh, that was really the emphasis to get, to get this going. 
I love telling the story. Billy's not with us anymore, but um, the first bill that I brought to the legislature was the Farm Winery Act. And everybody in the whole Texas legislature said, Alder, there is no way in God's green earth you will get that passed. And so, I, you know, I was pretty dejected about it. And I went to Bill Clayton's office, who was speaker, and Billy read over it and said, you shouldn't have any problem with this bill. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> good Lord. What happened? And so shortly thereafter, sailed through the House, sailed through the Senate. Governor Briscoe signed it. I thought, how in the world did that happen? Well, I didn't know at the time that uh, Billy Clayton had planted a vineyard at Spring Lake, where he was from. And it's amazing how things like that work. And then, but then when that was passed, the forces that Paul was referring to uh, that really kept the lid on the industry because this was a bear, uh, you know, a liquor state, uh, were dedicated to the proposition that we will give this industry nothing. And so we had to chip away to get, get rid of some of the things that we couldn't do to at least allow us to become wineries. And over the years, I, uh, others entered the picture and the wine industry is far from perfect today in terms of what the laws are but it's infinitely better when I hear somebody complaining about it today I think of, you should have seen what it was like in 1980 right. or 82 uh -huh. and uh, so you know necessity is the mother of invention and uh, legislative change was a necessity and right after we, we got started. And it's, uh, you know, one of those things that I, uh, I've, like I, say, I don't know whether I enjoyed it or I couldn't stand it, but I did it. I, 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 I was born and raised in a small town of El Paso, Texas, in the desert. And the two things that always excited me were grapes, as a kid, and pine trees. Because you didn't have either one in El Paso, you didn't have much green at all. That's what uh, really was my interest, and it really began to become uh, more important to me when I moved to, to Dallas after graduating from A&M. And <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, reading about Dr. Bobby Smith uh, in the paper about his ventures, and so I got to meet him and talk to him, and that's how I really got going. Um, one is that my wife was a wonderful French cook, and so I thought that I would try to learn something about food and wine pairing, and and we would occasionally have have wine with with a French meal that she would cook, and uh, so now we're in it's uh, in the 1980s, and you really can't buy wine in. Texas, maybe you know, with, without a great deal of effort, and and it was the first uh, Robert Parker production of a, uh, a, a Xeroxed uh, mimeograph foldover that he mailed out every two weeks for ten dollars. You got one every two weeks to learn about wine, and so the first one I got, this is 1984. He said, "Buy 82 uh, first growth Bordeaux, uh, maybe the best wine ever made, and buy it in Magnum." So. Um, I, uh, so I'm calling around, I find a store called Zaki's in New York, and uh, I said, do you have magnums of Lafitte and Mouton and uh, uh, the, uh, all the other great first growths of Bordeaux? And they said, yes, we do. How much are they? I, I, they, I said, they said, $50. I said, my gosh, $50 for a magnum of, uh, but a magnum, a magnum of 82 Margot right now would be, would return very, very well with my investment. Of course, we drank it. But anyway, I got uh, I got six cases of Magnum, six different wines, and this was a big investment. I was a little uncomfortable about it. It came in, I sort of put it in the closet, and uh, so Bunny made a, some wonderful French meal, and, and guess what? Uh, 82 Lafitte is really good with almost anything. And um, so we thought that um, maybe we'd try to find a little place uh, in, the, in the hill country and for weekends. And uh, Bunny's requirement was no yard work. And uh, 
you know, when you have 1,100 vines per acre and you have 50, that's, that's a lot of yard work. But uh, so anyway, that didn't last. And, uh, but then I sort of started getting interested in wine, the tasting wine by people made around me at, at, uh, at uh, uh, by Ned Sims at Grape Creek and Bob Oberhelman uh, at Bell Mountain and talking to them and trying to learn about wine. I really got, and I've always loved to grow things. The last part of this sort of illogical construct is that uh, I always had a gardens. I love to grow, to grow things. And so I thought, well, maybe we could try growing grapes. And so I learned a lot from other vineyards around us and then we traveled a lot and I like to read a lot. And so, and this is a, an enormous learning curve. It's, uh, it's art and science. And, uh, and I, I don't know where we all think we are on that learning curve, but I'm, I'll tell you I'm about halfway up, in, in my opinion, of, of assessing my, my skills. In 1984, I decided that I was going to show the growers in the High Plains how wine is made. So I decided to rent a rider truck and uh, put a 1500 gallon uh, tank on the, on the flatbed and took my uh, basket press and I took my stemma crusher and took all this equipment to Pete Laney's house. And uh, Ed mentioned uh, uh, Billy Clayton. He was the speaker of the house and he was one of my growers. And we were going up there to pick some of the grapes that Billy was growing and Pete Laney was growing because Pete became the Speaker of the House. So we really had a perfect storm. I mean, we had the Speaker of the House interested in our industry and the incoming Speaker of the House, all grape growers. So that was the time when we really got a lot of legislation done. Plus, we also had Susan Combs as our Commissioner of Agriculture, and she was the most strongly advocating uh, commissioner we've ever had in, in the industry. So I load all this stuff up, not even thinking about the law, and I drive all this to Pete Laney's house and I start making Zinfandel all day long. So I'm, I'm crushing fruit and uh, fortunately I showed up there in a white t-shirt with white tennis shorts. And, and white tennis shoes. And by the end of the day, I was totally purple from the neck down. I was so disgustingly full of juice that I asked Pete's wife if she would let me take a shower in the house. And she said, under no circumstances <laughs> could I go in the house. And so she did tell me I could jump in the pool. And so I jumped in the pool. And to this day, every time I see Pete, he says the pool still has a purple ring around the pool for my outfit. Well, I loaded up all this juice that I had produced all day long, and I started heading home, never thinking about how illegal this whole thing is because I am a moving winery on a flatbed. And the thing that amazes me, it took me 13, 14 hours to get back to Brian and not a single police officer stopped me. And, and that was amazing to me that, I mean, this thing looked like the Beverly Hillbillies, uh, you know, uh, going back to Bryan. And um, I uh, took the wine back to the winery and Meryl was so sweet, she offloaded into the tanks. I slept because I hadn't slept in almost two days. We made that wine and it was a White Zinn back in 1984, it was very popular. And I submitted that wine to the Eastern International Wine Competition uh, about six weeks later, and it won the best white Zinfandel made in the United States. So they invited me to go to New York and to tell them how I made this wine. And so I'm at a luncheon and I gave them the story about me making wine on the back of a pickup, uh, you know, in a flatbed. And to this day, I don't think anybody believed the story, but it, it's a true story. And. Uh, but those are the kinds of crazy things that happened. But we had uh, Billy Clayton, who was our uh, Speaker of the House, and then Pete Laney coming in as the Speaker, and then Susan Combs. And those folks, they opened the doors for us because when we had the legislation that you know was brought forward by Twigga, um, it was received extremely positively, and that was not happening prior to that. I mean, the, the liquor lobby was extremely powerful in the state and uh, all of a sudden 
things started opening up. I grew up in agriculture, not directly on the farm. I, I grew up in actually in a cotton gin and my mom and dad bought a small farm to retire to. So that's kind of when I fell in farming was about my senior year in high school when my mom and dad bought the farm. Uh, I went away to Texas Tech and my freshman chemistry professor was a Dr. Roy Mitchell, which at the time was a home winemaker. He later became quite famous in West Texas. Uh, uh, Yano Estacado, Doc McPherson, uh, Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed was across, or Dr. Reed was across, um, yeah, and Doc McPherson. They were across the hall from Roy Mitchell. Uh, he talked about winemaking and how it could connect to West Texas and com comparing similar climates which in this situation would be altitude because where we're at in West Texas, we're 36 and 3,700 feet, which is, which is high because a high Napa Valley a vineyard would be 2,500. Uh, I came back to Plains, got interested in alternative, or got interested in cotton farming, started farming. I've always been interested in alternative crops and I just happened to think of grapes one day and started reading everything I could find. And, uh, uh, I heard about Twiga and uh, joined and crossed paths with Dr. Mitchell again. And uh, one thing led to another and Janice and I decided to plant three acres of Cabernet. This was in 1985, which we get the vines in 86. So we started in 86. We, when we went together, I made reference to making a Hill Country Appalachian, uh, which you had to prove that the land was geologically different. and. You know, I was a pilot for 28 years and I've been a geography nut ever since I was a little kid. So I, I could figure out what part of the Edwards Plateau was and wasn't. And uh, you had to prove that it was climatically different. And it, ever, even though people probably think it, the climate in Texas is uniform, it's far from it. And I could point out the difference in the climate, but it had to be a known wine producing region. This was difficult because at the time we had three wineries in the area that's a little smaller than the state of Iowa, you know, and uh, so what were we gonna do? Well, at the time, this industry was, and it's really early, start, well, getting out of infancy perhaps, would be a better way to put it. The Southwest regional cuisine was being developed by such people as Robert Del Grande, Dean Faring, Ann Greer, and some others. And uh, they were taking our wines with them to festivals in L.A., Wolfgang Pucker, to New York, or this or that. And those festivals were a breeze to go to. The TABC wasn't going to let us do a Hill Country right. Wine and right. Food Festival. Right. They thought, this Paul said, we were, some, we were up to something. They didn't know what it was. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I can never, never forget. But why is this so important and relevant to what 
I was talking about the Hill Country Wine Food Festival. Well, we finally had our first one, our first Hill Country Wine Food Festival. All these newspapers and our section put in Texas Hill Country's first wine, food and wine festival. We clipped the article off out of the newspaper, attached it as exhibit A to the application, and our wine uh, region gets approved. Before that, we had nothing to tell them it was an approved wine region. And if the TABC had, had their way at the time, that wouldn't have happened. So uh, I grew up in New Zealand. Um, I uh, um, came from a, a family that drank moderately, mostly, um, mostly beer, um, as the culture in New Zealand was. Uh, during my college time, I started working at a, um, at a wine store and so got an interest in wine and they, at that time they were sending over uh, Australian Shiraz uh, and, and so that became kind of interesting and that was starting to grow. It was a small part of a wine culture was developing. Um, so when, um, when I uh, eventually got, a, um, uh, got away from New Zealand and, and actually came over, over to the US, um, and I'd, I'd had some experience in New Zealand with the New Zealand Wine and Grape Growers uh, um, group. And so I'd, I'd worked for them uh, at that time. It was really more the grape growers side of it. The, there was, they'd actually split into two, but that's another story. Um, and, and so when I came to um, the US to do my graduate studies, uh, I, I was, um, got involved very early um, in the, uh, not about 1988, I think it was, um, with the, just this brand new industry. And uh, I'd had a little bit of experience in New Zealand. And so um, I started doing research, uh, marketing research, which was my academic study, and, uh, and then got involved from there. I, I think Texas has started to carve out a niche and, and it, it was a lot of things that all came together. Uh, it was expertise um, that grew it within the industry from education, from people coming from different places, trying, putting all that together. It was a change in culture where uh, Texans um, were moving away from the sort of prohibition kinds of attitudes. I know, I know when I was in Lubbock um, back in the late 1980s, uh, a lot of the whole city was dry. Um, and so that moved towards accepting alcohol, accepting consumption of wine was, um, was growing. So there was a lot of things that, as I say, started coming together and um, as, they, as they did, people were looking for also for new and different wine regions. Um, they were learning and, and education is a huge part of our industry. Um, as people learn about new varieties, about different regions, they want to try different things. Most, most wine drinkers do not want to sit and have the same wine every day, uh, or, you know, and, and, and they want to try different things. And so I think Texas opened up an opportunity uh, here within the state. There's a lot of pride in, in Texas towards things that are Texas, uh, whether it be meat, whether it be our, our culture, all the things uh, here. And so when they, when they started seeing that, hey, there's a wine that's, uh, that's coming and it's actually winning awards uh, nationally. It's competing against California wines and French wines and, and it's doing very well. Um, then they started believing and, and that has, has taken hold. And, and um, you know, the, the other aspect that's I think extremely important and that is often overlooked is the visits to wineries. Um, that provided a huge educational opportunity for people to go there. Even if they were a little skeptical and they didn't know about Texas wines, they would, they would go there, they would visit with the winemaker, they would learn about this new industry, they would try some different wines, and it, and it kind of took the risk away from having to buy a bottle, they would try a couple of glasses and go, oh, this is great. And then they'd take some home with them, share it with friends. And so I, it, th there's a lot of things that all came together over a, over a long um, time period, but uh, I, I think it really all came together to uh, create this um, this great brand that's now uh, you know a, a huge economic impact on our state. Uh, we uh, to so so we plant our vineyard in uh, in ninety two and it's now ninety five and we're ready to harvest it and there's a we, we were winery number twenty nine in the history of Texas. you were, you were probably seven eighteen or something do you do you know what your bond number was for when you were? I was 23. 23, and what were you? I don't even know. <laughs> so now there's 600. So just between the time that, that, that 
we started, uh, there's been a, a, a tremendous proliferation. But, to, but, but the, the law was, now that you're not going on the back of a pickup, you're trying to make it now in a building, you had to be approved by the, by the BATF. And there were some elaborate papers, and we filled them all out. And, and the grapes are getting, harve- are, are getting ready for harvest, they're getting ripe. If you don't, we don't harvest them, we lose them. We have 10 acres of grapes we're going to harvest for the first harvest. And uh, we couldn't get it approved. So my wife, Bunny, said, you have to go down there and meet with them. Because they, she had been, and, and Jim Brown, who was a wonderful person who helped us the first 10 years, we could not get them to approve it, even though we had not missed any, had not made any mistakes in the application. So now I, I, I leave off and I'm there, and I'm in front of this young man. And, and I said, that, you know, we're, we'd, we're going to harvest next week. We have to have an approved place to take these grapes and begin making wine. And he says to me, it, it will not be possible for us to approve your application over that time span. And, I, and then from another room comes a, a, a woman's voice and she says, your application will be approved today. And he says without blinking, your application will be approved today. <laughs> that actually happened. Well, and I said, good. Maybe one of the earliest people in this whole crowd to have joined Twigger. When I joined Twigga, it wasn't even called Twigga, it was called TGGA, Texas Grape Growers Association. It was 1979. I, um, the way I got interested in wine was, uh, I'm a microbiologist. Uh, I got my degree at Texas Tech, master's degree, and I got interested in, well, I, I was, I've been interested in winemaking since I was a kid because I grew up in Abilene, Texas, which you had to drive 100 miles to buy a beer. So I, I, made, I made wines from grape juice for my dad. <laughs> anyway, um, I uh, was in the pharmaceutical industry. That's how I went into the pharmaceutical industry. And they're very similar. The pharmaceutical industry and the wine pr- production industry are similar in many ways. Stainless steel equipment, uh, the process controls are very similar. Uh, aseptic processing, you have to have, you know, uh, purified systems, steam sterilization, so forth. And in this uh, work that I did, I was mostly in manufacturing and quality, quality assurance manufacturing in the international division of Alcon Laboratories, which is where I had spent most of my years, about 30 years. And interestingly, uh, I was traveling into Europe, South America, uh, even South Africa on occasions, because we had plants in all of these places. We had several plants in in Europe, in France, Belgium, uh, Spain, Italy. And um, so I got exposure to the wine industry before most people in the U.S., or especially in Texas, but uh, in the uh, early 80s and 90s, uh, before it was really a big popular thing here in the U.S. In those countries, it's everybody that's been their life for centuries. So I got exposed to wine making and viticulture very early, and I was just really into it. So I had this mind of doing a winery from the very beginning, from from way back. And so I, I started my winery. I didn't. I, I planted my first vineyard in '95. And uh, then I, uh, I retired from Alcon in 98 and planted my first big vineyard on my estate. And, but I didn't start my winery until 2006. But the interest was there, and that's how that interest developed. I'm trying hard to see how I can condense this. <laughs> <laughs> my um, interest in grapes when I let the public know, at that particular time, it was in 1995, and it was, had the, it was a 40-year secret. And what was very interesting was that it was time for me to come back to the United States, and I happened to uh, meet a fellow en route to Spain, I say humbly. That was a little bit of a pest. And uh, after enduring him for several days, and he asked, did you know me before this trip? And I said, Cam, 
no, I didn't. He said, didn't that I know his wife? I said, no. He says, well, what about my father-in-law? And he said, I said, who is he? He said, E.J. McGraw. I said, sure, I know Mr. McGraw. He owns the other half of the Oakland Raiders. And this trip was something that the Raiders were taking some former teammates and players to Spain, to Barcelona. And I say humbly, I was just happened to play for them and happened to be invited. Well, through the course of the next five to six days, this young fella, Cam McLeod, followed me 80% of wherever I went. And constantly said, you know, I'm being a pest. I said, no, you're not being a pest, fine. I said, you wear your feelings on your shoulder. He says, well, you know what, come, come see me. I said, Cam, I'll come see you. He said, now everybody says they'll come, but nobody shows up. I said, if I tell you I'll come, I'll come. I said, well, where you live in, Berkeley? Walnut Hill, what part of Oakland? He says, no. I say, well, then where? He says, we live in the Rutherford section of Napa. And silently I said, and then aloud, oh, I'll be there. So um, he said, sure. I said, yes. I said, you know, I look forward to uh, bringing my wife out and uh, because I want to do research on growing grapes. He says, where are you going to grow grapes? I said, Texas. He says, well, I tell you what. When you come out, I'm going to introduce you to two guys. One that went to UC Davis, and the other that the old-fashioned, hands up. Went back, told my wife about meeting Cam and Michelle, and she got a little feisty about me being overzealous and inviting myself to, you know, the Rutherford section of Napa, but she, she came with me. <laughs> And uh, as we did research on reference to the best soils, the type of soils, red sandy loam, etc., water, the top three varietals, Cadmillo and Chardonnay, and making other notes for the several three or four days and then went back to Mexico and started to chart what I'd like everything I'd learned and where I I think that I was going to come and do this. Well, Texas. And the kids thought that I had been drinking or smoking something <laughs> because I was uh, giving up playing chess, drinking mezcal, closing up the tequila bar, and going deep sea fishing. Definitely, we were, we in we were always looking for niche markets. Uh, we didn't want to do the traditional uh, massive cotton from turn row to turn row. We um, were, had been doing organic farming for about uh, 20 years at the time, but we realized one of those crops was in uh, peanuts, which used a lot of water. And one of our goals was how can we use our water wiser on the high plains especially? And a friend of mine, Jet Wilma, said, well, you might want to consider uh, grapes. Uh, started looking into it and I thought, well, I also want to know, you know, where do I sell them to? Which brings up Dr. Becker. Uh, Dr. Becker, when he found out, as long as I was using a goods consultant, that he would buy my grapes. I had never planted a grape in my life. And he signed a contract with me to grow my first grapes. It's so bizarre. After I planted them, I thought, oh, and we harvest at nighttime? There was a whole lot of things that I was very green at when I started. So but our family doesn't have a background in winemaking. We didn't grow up in the industry like you guys did. Um, my grandfather, who was a country doctor, he had a vineyard, and I didn't realize until after he had passed away that he used to make wine and beer and all those things. Uh, but that's not really our background. It was really, for me, um, seventh grade science class in Missouri. Our science teacher taught us how to ferment uh, grape juice into wine, which is completely against the law today. And I tasted my experiment and I fell in love with wine. And my dad, being a Southern Baptist preacher, he said, yes, I could make wine. I used to make it in the garage growing up. And I just have always loved wine. Then I was in the corporate world, got to travel, got to drink some great wines. As a finance person, I realized that it's very difficult to make money in the wine business, right? 
So until about 18 years ago, I left the corporate world and started a winery because I just love everything about huh. wine. Uh, well, uh, I had the really good fortune of having to go to Spain uh, in 1999 to get my Spanish credit to graduate from UT. And uh, I just fell in love with Tempranillo in Spain and, and I, the wine culture in Europe, which I just was not experienced in as, as a kid in Texas. And I just fell in love and, and uh, I, the, the, I really loved the Spanish people. I loved, I thought Spain reminded me of the hill country where I grew up. And I, and I loved how wine kind of, wine and food culture was so more pervasive than it was, you know, growing up in the hill country, it was barbecue or Mexican food and, you know, a little beer or something. But we, you know, I just, I loved that, that focus on food and wine and family and being together. And it just was enlightening for me. And it, I, I was, I had another plan that I was going to go to law school and do all, all these other things. And wine kind of came to me that summer. It was always in the back of my mind. And when when I failed miserably at my first endeavors, uh, we tried to find what we can do. And being, you know, being a rancher and a farmer, or a lineage of ranchers and farmers from Texas, I thought, let's let's do this. We can grow Tempranillo in this state. We can do it. And so that was kind of the impetus. And that and the Ed and Susan Aller from Fall Creek are our cousins. And so we grew up, you know, around it. And we knew it was there. I didn't have a whole lot to do with it, but I was aware of it more so probably than others because of that. What did they tell you to do? Not be in the wine industry. Very, very adamantly, don't do this. <laughs> Ed was against it. Uh, I did not grow up with a wine background at all. In fact, I grew up in the Baptist church where we didn't drink wine. In fact, my understanding was the only people that drank wine were bums and rich people, and that's as much as I knew about wine. But when I got married in the early 80s, uh, my father-in-law introduced me to fine wine and the appreciation of wine and wine as part of a good meal and uh, gave me the book, Windows in the World, and the Windows of the World uh, the wine book from the, from the restaurant that was on top of the World Trade Center. I still have that book. And so I've had a deep appreciation for wine, but um, it wasn't until about 13 or 14 years ago as I was transitioning out of another career that uh, we just started to go down this path as a, as a, I, as a second always, career. M my wife and I always said we would never pressure Paul to go into the, even though we have an extensive tradition of at least wine appreciation in, uh, in, in our family. Uh, but he he was totally dedicated to becoming a Marine Corps officer. So at age 12, his room was uh, changed into camouflage. And uh, I said, uh, what's this about? And he says, I'm going to go to the Naval Academy and I'm going to be a Marine officer. And sure enough, that's exactly what he did. He uh, uh, went to the Naval Academy, became a Marine officer, went to Iraq twice. And I think he realized that if he stayed in the Marine Corps, he was always going to have a disruptive life and family life. So he gave us a call in 2010 and said, I want to come back to the family business. And so from 2010 until 2015, we developed a five-year plan because transition is not easy. It's a difficult thing. When you have a baby for 45 years, it's hard to take the baby and just say, okay, it's yours now. And, uh, you know, go on, on vacation because that doesn't happen. Uh, so we had a five-year plan and it was very structured and he owns the place and now uh, if he wants advice, he'll ask. Uh, I do not volunteer uh, to give him advice uh, because if it's not asked, it's not desired and uh, it's his baby. And uh, the thing I'm so proud of is the fact that, God, I hope he, he, he uh, his uh, genetics uh, have really seemed to be good because his palate is fabulous. So. He, he's made some extraordinary wine, and that, that makes us, my wife and I, extremely happy. And the fact that he's, he's so logistically oriented from that Marine Corps training, that he's been a good operator of a winery as well, because you have to be an artist, but you also have to have a good, strong business sense. Uh, and you know, we, we looked at this and said, oh my God, 80% of the time on the second generation transition, they fail. And uh, normally they fail within the first three years. So we're now five years down the road and uh, he seems to be doing just fine. And, you know, it makes us feel very, very happy. And now his daughter, who's 12 years old, has already put him on notice that when she's uh, in her early 20s, he's out of a job and she's taking over. So, you know, it's going to be real interesting what happens with that. I grew up in the vineyard and the winery. So 
um, I had that great opportunity to not only have the experience of, of doing the work, but also in travels that my parents had throughout the state to Twiga, to other wineries, I got a chance to experience the family that is the Texas wine industry. And so whenever I exited the Marine Corps, um, I mean, I, I had always wanted to be a part of that. Uh, and I believe in our industry. And so I, it wasn't that there wasn't a choice, it was definitely a choice, but I, I felt like um, it, was, it was my calling to come back and be a part of this and hopefully be able to not only help Messina Hop grow, but help the Texas wine industry grow as well. Twiga is, is not an organization of wineries. It's an organization of growers. It's, a, it's, it's an agricultural uh, institution, and that's, that's the absolute basis of, of the wine industry. But it's not necessarily, they're not on the same business plane as the wineries. They don't think the same thoughts that we think. And so it's uh, get, so getting us all in the same room and banging our heads together and getting us to agree is is fine to do. It's like it's like what what Winston Churchill said about a democracy. It's the worst possible form of government, but it's better than all the others. And so it's great to have the growers and the and the winery people uh, together. And and I and I think with the quality of grape growing and the quality of winemaking, I'm I'm optimistic. A unified industry is critical for us because Absolutely. California has the California grape growers, they have the, tech, the California wineries, they're two separate organizations, there must be at least a half a dozen to a dozen organizations in California. That makes it very difficult when you go before the legislature because you've got a fragmentation of the industry. They be, tw they Twigger, became, um, very important in bringing the state congressmen and persons that were questioning our legitimate being, sh shun those congress persons that we were one. Because all of them, all of them, felt that we were feuding at one time. So it was very, it was a major accomplishment to show that. And once a congressperson from the north could say, well, you know, talk to somebody in the south, say, well, you know, they aren't feuding and everybody's asking for the same thing. And we agreed that we would ask for the same thing, even though my good friend here to my left might get 70% and I only get 30. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't get that's okay. Because <laughs> the next time I got 70 and he got 30, okay? So, uh, you know, it was like, uh, your turn is going to come. So let's present a united front so that we all can progress. And Twigger was the main catalyst in this and showing it to individuals across the state. Twigger has this way of uniting growers with wineries. That is so important because almost anywhere else in the world it's like this. And um, so I, sure, there's, there's gonna be some differences, I know that, but, but Twigger has done a very good job of uniting growers with wineries and uh, associating vendors with wineries and growers. So when we have these meetings, all these vendors are here and we interact. And Twiggle has set that up for us. And then also they've done a great job of, of, of coordinating Texas wineries with wineries in other states and other locations. So I think those three things also are important contributions from, from Twiggle to our industry. We, we've got to have the correlation, the community of bringing growers and winemakers together. You might not feel like it's important to be a part of Twiga, but it, it is paramount that we keep an organization that, that pushes us together to help create this 
very, very bright future ahead of us going in the right direction. And it comes by constantly communicating, networking, uh, education, the, the legislative issues. There's so many issues that we're having to deal with. Uh, how do we not become extinct because another interest group comes in and wants to lobby for something that we don't need on the table out there. So there, there's so many issues that is so important for us as a group to stay together. You might think at first, well, why do I need to pay my dues? Uh, and I know I'm getting kind of sidetracked on, on, on another issue, but it's, it's extremely important. Um, the reason to pay the dues is not always because, well, I'm, I'm getting that much worth right now at this particular whatever. It's no, it's to keeping an organization alive that desperately needs to be able to be at the forefront of these education issues, research issues, uh, leg uh, legislative networking, 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 networking. And that's what Neil has helped me to see is the importance of, we we've, got to, we've got to network even your best great growing competitor. You need to help him network with the winery over here because there is, there's so much room for all of us in this industry to become the next right behind California or whatever. It doesn't need to be one of these other states. The potential is right here. Networking's how we all, we were all, you know, novices at one time, or maybe several times in my case, you know, there were several different careers. Uh, and, 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 and people for no reason at all, they just take you in. How can you not pay that back? I mean, and, and I love doing it. It's, you know, you give back, you, you pay it forward. You know, here we are at the Twigga Conference for, you know, 2022. And I don't know how many vendors do we have out in the in, uh, 60, 70, I don't know. You know, where else could you get that many people, you know, that they want your business, but they're also willing to give you advice. And if they can't help you, they'll be honest about it. Plus, there's you've got you've got winery people here that are needing grapes. You've got growers here that are needing to sell grapes. It, this is this is the you know the utopia for you know three days a year. Every winemaker, every grower needs to be here for those reasons. Yeah. Um, now, Twiga also is involved with your Newsom, uh, your grape. Right. Team. Yeah. Every, every region, there's five wine growing regions in Texas, and we're region one. Every region has a uh, a, a, a grape day, kind of what we call it, uh, uh, each year. Uh, mine, mine is the last day of, uh, less, sorry, the last Friday of April each year. This year it's April 29. If you're interested in the wine industry in any way, I encourage you to come. Winemaker, potential winemaker, grower, potential grower. If you're as green, as, if you're so green you think you're green, well, it doesn't matter. We were all that way one time. Come on. And, and there'll be people just like you. There's people that's going to take you in and tell you know they'll, you know, all the you know all tide raise all ships. That's the way we believe. We're all a big family. When we get together like this, you know, we have a lot of fun. We all know each other enough. You know, we can joke around and not hurt anybody's feelings. We have a great time. So I, I, I got involved uh, with Twigger um, as part of us um, at. Texas Tech doing educational uh, efforts. Um, I think one of the key things that, that Twigger was, uh, that, that was important, was to provide education. Um, and you know, people that were thinking of wanting to get into the industry, how do you start this? And, and it was also just a great venue to be able to meet people and, and kind of get all these questions answered. And so for me, that was a, a great opportunity, again, to meet wineries to, to meet um, some of the grape growers. It, it gave me both a source of data that I could use for, for my research, um, but also it allowed me to present information that we were learning about the wine market, how things were going, and then eventually um, to do an economic impact study that I think was important in, in showing how this industry could really have an impact on the state. And, and I think Twigger, provide, again, provided that venue for us to be able to do all that. Bob and I are actually speaking on the same one, I think, along with my wife, and it has to do with some of the things that we started applying during the COVID reopening that we find are actually smart and helpful things to do. What things good came out of COVID that we can apply to our, uh, our tasting room practices or our winery practices? So, yeah. 
we were forced to do things differently, right? Yeah, exactly. Didn't want to go bankrupt, and <laughs> right. yeah. we all, it's yeah. things we probably should have been doing all along. My, my parents gave a talk on secession and they did you you know that was something that we collaborated on but um, you know there there are actually a lot of transitionings happening in our industry right now um, which is a great thing because now we're an old enough industry that we have generations turning over to generations and so that talk was primarily covering like hey what what should you consider when you're doing um, uh, planning for the future uh, and I think that, that that applies to most businesses in our industry. I'm on one of our tasting panels and they're one of the more fun, uh, interactive things that we do here and it has to do with a certain wine varietal where we'll bring in four different winemakers and they'll bring samples of their wine and we're doing this on, in my case, on Saturday uh, for Morvedra. Everybody makes wine a little differently so uh, if you're a winemaker or interested in winemaking, we really, we break it down for you all the way in terms of how the wine was made, how the grapes were grown and you get to taste what the resulting wine is. Yeah, there's great education here at the conference. Also, of course, the big benefit is just the networking, getting the chance to see people, visit with them, right? Meet new growers, you know, a new lot, connections. A lot of the deals are done out in the lobby. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Yes. And we have great vendors yes. that you can, you know, get your supplies from and everything else too. That so. vendor right there has got a lot of my money. <laughs>
uh, with the foundation, and then I took a position as an at-large director and then a Region 2 director, and then was asked to run for uh, president-elect uh, the year that Paul was president. That's, that's correct. I came as president-elect as you were going into president. And uh, I'm known as the COVID president. So my presidency kicked off in February two years ago. That would be 2020. And, uh, you know, within six weeks, we were shutting down wineries all over the state at the direction of the governor. And there were a lot of issues that ensued after that that needed a lot of, you know, a lot of serious attention, a lot of work and uh, trying to reach out to the governor in terms of how wineries should be tre treated as opposed to bars and other types of establishment. And it was a, it was quite a task. But, you know, it's like I've said, we all kind of work as a triumvirate because even though I was the president, Paul was past president, he was in the trenches with me and Roxanne, she was getting ramped up because we knew this was going to be more than a one year thing. So all three of us were still working together. So even when your presidency's over, you don't get to leave the clubhouse just yet. So <laughs> um, is there anything specific from those those COVID years that uh, you want to talk about? The thing it brought to my attention, and we talk about this, people get, people come to the Twiga conferences and they come to the regional meetings and they give their input, but they don't realize the real value of that organization until you hit a crisis like that. And then your phone's blowing up with people that you've never spoken to. They're wanting attention and they're wanting action right now. And you're, you know, you're pedaling as fast as you can. You're doing the best that you can. Uh, I just, my, my wish would be that people would remember that and even in times where uh, we're not in crisis mode, Twiga needs their support and their participation. You know, mine was a uh, legislative year, which there were some issues there, but it was extremely, extremely smooth sailing because of Gene Estes, who was the president before me. He had the task of, uh, we had an executive director who was moving on, and so he had the task of bringing on a new one, and it was not, very easy and it wasn't quite as successful and he worked and worked and worked and he did he he had a lot of challenges of it he's a very diligent person a very good person at uh, helping both sides of an issue come together they're very diplomatic and almost to the day that I was sworn into office for that next year it was unbelievably peaceful and that's exactly what I needed because I didn't know if I would have been addressed with some of the issues that Gene Estes would have been dress, addressed with. It would have been chaos, I assure you, uh, because I, I wasn't familiar with that. Him being in the professional world more, he, he brought his expertise to the table. So my stint was thanks to Gene Estes. Uh, and that's the reason why it was so, so peaceful. <laughs> It was most certainly a legislative year. Uh, and the challenges were, we were kind of a divided, we were a really, in 2013, we were really, we hit a head where, hit a point where we were a growing industry. We were actually, it had been 10 year, I mean, I'm sure the folks that had been around longer than me would, would, would disagree with that. But for me, when we started in 07, 2013 was kind of the year that things started moving, I felt. The grapes, the, the grapes that were better suited to this part of the world were starting to grow, starting to produce. We had people moving from all over the world to be a part of this industry. We were growing internally. We were starting to make really, really good wine across the board, not just you know this people and this people and, and this group. We, the wine quality lifted across the board and it was tough. We were trying to figure out who we were and who we are. Uh, we had real issues in, I believe, defining what is is exactly a winery was the big question of that year and it was tough we had a lot of people with a lot of differing opinions and i got to go all over the state and let people yell at me and uh the best was you know in the senate hearings when senator corona yelled at me for about 20 minutes and the next day uh senator estes called me on a on his uh, on, on my cell phone and apologized for how getting badgered and it you know but it was all part of it and it, it's it was tough. I I wouldn't. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it at a, at a at an early age in in the business because I learned so much about what we are and what we're doing and who we are. And you know, it's one of those things that I'm sure I'll probably do it again sometime in my life. Don't say that on my camera, but one of these days I'll probably do it again. But it, it was great. And you know, we we're 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 growing and we we've got to have 
quality, effective people leading us. And it was, it was, honor, it was an honor and a, and a privilege to be a part of that. Um, so it's essential that we have Twig as an organization protecting our rights. Um, and so I, I would encourage any new, a, any winery or vineyard to join to be a part of that, to be able to not only be a part of protecting our industry and advancing our interests, but also um, having your voice heard. Because if you're not a part of Twiga, then you're not going to be able to have uh, your thoughts brought to the table and be a part of that. Ditto, 100%, right? And I like to tell people that are new wineries that are just getting ready to open, because they ask, why should I join Twiga, right? It's a question people ask all the time, like, what's in it for me? And I tell them, you wouldn't even be around today. You would not be able to open a winery and be financially successful if it wasn't for Twiga. If you go back 20 years ago, you couldn't go to a winery tasting room and buy a glass of wine or a bottle to go home. You could give wine away for free, right? But then the winery couldn't sell it to you, could not sell direct to consumer. The ability to do that came from Twiga. The ability to ship wine to consumers came from Twiga. And like you said, protecting those rights, a lot of people just don't realize that that all came from Twiga. Sometimes it's almost like Twig is a microcosm of, of the United States. We take things for granted sometimes. But if you go back and look at the history of it, and we had a past president's dinner during this uh, conference where we had a lot of the uh, folks that have represented us in the past tell some of these stories. And we don't want that history to be lost. You know, that people worked really hard to get us, to get a lot of these things that we have today and we enjoy. And for my entire period of time being president, I always wanted to be all inclusive. Lone Star National Wine Competition, I ran that for a long time. And I was always calling on everybody in the state to come together and participate in this because this is your competition, this is about you. And I didn't care if you didn't like the old blow down here and he didn't like you. It makes a difference you come tonight at this point. And that's the whole point about this industry. It is a clearinghouse for everybody, Twig is, to come together to talk common ground to learn from each other and to express your desires of what you want and what you want this industry to be. That's Twig. And that's what it should be.